And now. And now, introducing the one, the only. Now let me introduce to you. Lively talk with successful people, barely filtered. This is the Jenna Ben Show. All right, all right. Thank you so much for tuning into the Jenna Ben Show, guys. I'm here with Francis Ngannou, UFC number one heavyweight. I'm so excited to ring in my brand new studio with Francis Ngannou. I mean, he is so loved and respected by the fight community, but I don't know how to tell you. I'll let him speak for himself. How you doing? I'm doing good, uh, Jenna. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really happy to have you on. Um, As you can see, my studio is finally launched. I'm still making some edits, but I am really thrilled to have this space and hopefully have you here in person one day. Your studio looks pretty good. I mean, basically for someone who just, for just a first uh, studio, (laughs) it looks pretty good. I have have more stuff coming. And uh, yes, I'm very excited. As you guys can see, if you're looking at this video right now, I have Frank Shamrock's third championship belt from the UFC. On the other side, I have gloves from a very good friend of Francis's, um, Uriah Hall, who actually sent a message for you. Not only did he tell me to say Wakanda forever, (laughs) but he also texted me saying, I love Francis. Wakanda forever. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> he told me to say, I love Francis. We're like really good friends. Every time we pick on each other at the PI, um, I'm always speaking to him in an African accent and we're laughing and making fun of each other. He's a cool guy. He's like a little big brother. Yes, that's cool. That's true. We always talk with our uh, African accent. Like, yeah. how are you, my brother? <laughs> I love it. I love it. He makes fun of me in his accent too. So Uriah and I are going to do a a fight segment called Fight or Die on the show. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, The name is actually really relevant to him. So I'm excited to share that and hopefully have you on as well. Of course. Yes. Okay. So Francis, here on the Jenna Ben show, We talk about my friend's life story, basically, the progression of your professional career, how you got to achieve success, you know, basically what brought you to become the number one UFC heavyweight right now, and, um, you know, past, present, future type stuff. So before we dive in, though, you're 34 years old now. I want you to take us way back to when you were a boy. What were you like as a kid? Ooh. That is a very vague question. Like, <laughs> <laughs> were you wild? Were you, were you silly? Were you quiet? I was um, very quiet, very uh, lonely guy. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, uh, since my parents uh, divorced, I was six years old, and then I always uh, live somewhere that. Um, I was treated differently. So I, I, then I took time to like step back and think about it because uh, I moved uh, from uh, school to school. Um, I never really have a friend, neither at school or at home, you know? So um, that's made, made me uh, become a lonely boy. Like, but I was so thinking about the situation, what's going on, uh, what's, uh, what's went wrong, what did my parent uh, did wrong or something like that. But I had a dream. I had a dream who was to like uh, prove myself and uh, just, just uh, be, become a world-class uh, boxer because action was always my favorite thing. Like my friend would rather go play uh, soccer, but me, I love movies actions fighting stuff and they didn't like that for them that was brutal Mm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah Yeah. so so then i read somewhere that gangs tried to recruit you but you said no you wanted to do boxing instead i mean yeah um i wasn't a boy that time i was almost a man like uh when you grow up, up in s- s- uh, certain community, 
and when you go when you uh, when you are around some certain community and look big and, and strong you know um there's always people who want to take advantage of your um of your physique mm -hmm. or stuff like that but uh by the time i was already um settled of what i want to do i it was clear in my mind what i want to do how i don't uh, i didn't know yet but uh, that was what i wanted to do plus the fact that uh you know those people never end uh they never end well you know they would rather end in the prison or uh, get shot or stuff like that and uh, that wasn't something that i was interested by i loved myself so much to uh, even uh, picture myself in that type of situation mm -hmm. did your father um i i heard somewhere that your father kind of got involved with um like the rough type of life when you were younger no he didn't get involved my dad didn't get involved uh, with some type, type of life, but he was just like, um, uh, couldn't control his power, couldn't control his, um, I think his ego, or, I mean, I think he could have, he could have been more uh, responsible, and which is what he wasn't, um, because he was fighting all over, beating everyone up, even us at, at home. So, <clears throat> Is he kind of have some some reputation who wasn't good at all, and then when my parents got divorced, uh, that's where um, I was able to hear people uh, truly talk about my dad because nobody could have uh, could have tell him that uh, straight up, you know. Then uh, I have to I had to hear that from another people uh, somewhere else. And then I was ashamed of that. I was ashamed of my dad, uh, of the situation. Then um, right away, I was just six years old. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, I knew right there what I would, don't want to become. I don't want to become like my dad. I, I don't want to have his reputation. And that has been my, um, my drive. Interesting. It's so, see, we don't give mm. kids enough credit. As children, I remember like soaking in so much information and then people would be shocked when I would talk and make sense out of it all. Um, but yeah, you figure it out exactly what you didn't want to be when you were young. And it sounds like you made good decisions for yourself, even though you had a really rough start. So I did my research and I saw that you ended up in Spanish jail at one point. Um, for crossing the border illegally. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, that was almost like um, the accomplishment of the project. Uh, the project was um, uh, leaving Cameroon to somewhere that I will have more opportunity uh, for whether it's work or um, sport and chase my dream. For myself, it was uh, basically about my dream, who was a sport. So uh, I left Cameroon um, and then country after country, just travel, work or whatever uh, transport we use. Uh, we end up uh, in Morocco. Then uh, it, took, uh, it took me almost one year in Morocco to travel to Spain. And then when we went to Spain, we got caught in the water and then uh, they put her in jail for about two months. And uh, from there, they free us. Wow. So and what... that's, that's where I went in, 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 in Paris. What, uh, what was the jail like over there? Um, he was psychologically uh, tough, you know, um, like, you know, like, uh, they take you uh, out there and then um, take all your freedom and like just put you in a small cage like tell you what to do what time to shower what time to sleep what time to eat what time to this and I mean uh, at first when we get there we were very happy because finally we were there like uh, 
after a, a month and months of suffering in Morocco, trying to cross uh, all this uh, miserable life, everything that we've been through, um, we were happy to get somewhere um, that we can eat clean, sleep well, and but uh, in, in, uh, after a week weeks pass, we started get like feeling bad about it, like uh, a lot of pressure and get getting crazy. <laughs> it was tough. Wow. <laughs> because it wasn't like a it wasn't like a regular prison. It was a center of uh, uh, I don't know center of concentration. Some something like that. So it was uh, different, way more different about the prison. It was a psychologic prison. The one that uh, break you mentally down, and then maybe you sh you could tell the truth about where you truly came, where you truly are, oh, and wow. they can check and send you back in your country. Because when we get there, we don't tell where we are, where we are from. Otherwise, they will send you straight up uh, to your country and uh, all your effort will be vain. Wow. Okay, so let me get this straight. You went there with no passport, obviously. You were traveling illegally. So then they were interrogating you, trying to figure out where you're from and if you're a terrorist, essentially. And you had to stay mentally strong and not give them any information because you had finally arrived to your destination and you wanted to stay there. So you knew that you couldn't tell them where you're from because then they would deport you. Uh, yeah, but um, I mean, um, I don't think uh, they, they didn't treat us as a terrorist. Like uh, they just knew that we are uh, um, Migrant, immig migrant mm -hmm. and trying trying to go to Europe because that's the process. There's a lot of people there uh, doing the same thing uh, for years and years now. So we were we uh, were in the first, and we did, we are not we were not definitely the last uh, people. So uh, they know exactly uh, that we were just another a vague of uh, uh, African wanted to go to Europe and trying to work something uh, they knew that but at the meantime since uh, they have a um, European uh, Union has a, um, a program to um, to stop the uh, progression of immigration so they, tr they are trying so hard to really find out where you are from and if ever you have uh, uh, any kind of ID in on you then they would deport you straight uh, from where uh, that ID said. So you didn't bring your ID. So we make sure we make sure. Oh no, we make sure to not have any type of paper, anything that can serve for uh, uh, for clue. We don't give them not clue at all. And you have to say that and keep the same thing uh, over and over, telling the, the, the same story over and over, maybe for about two months. So it was kind of like a mental game. Wow, you are so strong. I don't know if I would have lasted one day. <laughs> so uh, yes, how but, did you- uh, at, at the end, everybody like almost get crazy, you know? At the end, uh, you just want, uh, you, you get at some point that you, you feel like you just want them to send you back so you can be free finally. Like you have a lot of pressure in. I think that's kind of a thought across your mind uh, a few times a day. Mm -hmm. And then you came back to the reality and realized that if you go back, um, that, that means uh, all your effort, uh, that you have done, all the suffering that you have been to uh, has been, uh, didn't help for nothing. So you want to make it worth it, you know, so you keep, you keep on going, you try, but every day, every hour is counted, it's very tough. So what did you do to pass the time? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. We had like a, we had like uh, maybe one hour out uh, each every day, and uh, they call that uh, in Spain they say pacho, 
when they say patio, we know, okay, it's one hour out uh, and we will go out sometime, uh, like just rabbit close like this and play like soccer because we didn't even have soccer. Um, um, we didn't even have a soccer ball, nothing. I mean, the, I, the, the purpose there was just to make us like, uh, to break us mentally. So yeah. they want to make you guys crazy. So we, I don't know, we try hold, hold up to into it until we get free. Yeah. Damn. After this, you were homeless for a while. Yes. After this, I went in France since I didn't know nobody in France. Um, I was homeless in Paris, but, um, I was very happy though. Uh, I think that was one, that is one of the best moments in my life, you know, uh, uh, like the apogee after being through all this type of, uh, suffering after being through all this, uh, process in 14, 14 months, you end up somewhere that you're free. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're homeless, but it's. It's better than uh, sleeping in the forest in Morocco. It's better than find yourself in the desert in uh, uh, in Morocco or Algeria. It's better than uh, being in jail in Spain. In Spain, so and that was kind of like um, the other side of the fan. So you are like, okay, I'm homeless, but I'm in the land of the opportunity. This is what I've been looking for, uh, for my entire life. It's time, you know, so you don't have to like uh, complaining about like have not having a place to sleep. Basically, when you know, uh, when you know that it's just a matter of time, you need uh, to find your way and it's possible. That's the most important thing, knowing that it's possible to uh, make your way out there. So I was here thinking that being homeless was probably a big nightmare because my understanding was, okay, you had nowhere to sleep. You had no friends. You had no money. but it's all perspective because you were just in jail. You yes. were excited to be free. Yes. And uh, yeah. And uh, being a homeless in France for me was like, uh, I mean, it was one already better than the life that I had before, you know? Wow. And uh, yes, uh, the perspective of thinking about the opportunity that I have in France of practicing the sport that I love and maybe uh, chase my dream was stronger than, than, uh, than everything. So um, I couldn't give that up uh, for nothing. So for me, it was the best time. I was so, so happy. People was even like, um, People was showing a mercy, mercy uh, to me, like, oh, you're homeless. He might be rough. He might be this. I'm like, please, excuse me. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. I, <laughs> you know, I came from, uh, I came from, uh, I came far, you know, and uh, finally I get somewhere that I have the, um, the opportunity, somewhere that I know is possible. Uh, even though I didn't have nothing, but I have a hope of having something. I have a hope of doing something. I have a hope of going somewhere, you know, uh, there's a, like, you know, like seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. It was something like that. So, uh, no matter if you're barefoot or walking in the, uh, concrete barefoot, but you, the excitement, the emotion, uh, get you, uh, out of there. It get you high, high, and you don't realize a lot of uh, difficulty that uh, you are into at the moment. Wow, I love that. Now, what did you learn about people being on the other side? You know, because your life has taken a 180 turn. You went from being sort of in a detention camp and being interrogated and then being homeless on the streets. Uh, and now you are the number one UFC heavyweight uh, I'm assuming going up for the title, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, what did you learn about people being on the other side? Uh, you know, people are people. People are just uh, how they are. You will find a good people. 
mostly you will find people who uh, uh, who don't dare chase their dream. You will find people who would like to uh, take over everything. I mean, you will meet every kind of people, mm -hmm. good, bad. I think, but all that is necessary because good good people helps you. Bad people helps you as well to collect a life experience and to understand how things work to uh, learn uh, from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you learn any tricks um, while you were living on the streets that, that you kind of still use today? Mm, I think the uh, tricks that, that I had, I learned from the time. I mean, I have a tricks uh, from my past from uh, living in Morocco in the forest, from being in jail, and that hurt me uh, while I was homeless. That hurt me um, to realize that uh, uh, there's always a bad, uh, worse situation than what we have, you know. Um, and of course, even today, uh, I can still uh, lean on that tricks because um, when, when uh, things uh, uh, when things go wrong, sometimes you can just uh, think about it and realize that um, he he could have been worse, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, when things get better, you get uh, when things are good, you can also realize that it it, it can get better, you know. So that push you, that motivate you to move, uh, no matter what. Mm. I read somewhere about your dreams. You had talked about, uh, you know, at one point you're homeless and you don't have anything and then you start to make money and then you want and you need everything. And then, um, but the purpose is not collecting things. You said the purpose is to do something great, to finish the dream that you started. So at this point in time, where are you at in your dream? Well, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm following, I'm chasing my dream. <laughs> I'm still in the process of still chasing in the process. my dream. Yeah, I okay, so accomplish it. what are yeah. like the top three things that you would like to achieve? What is the top three thing? Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is to become a champion. The second one, I don't know, you know, uh, my... Uh, my perspective about this is uh, let the sky be the limit. I don't know. Whatever is possible uh, on my way, I will just do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't set myself a boundary. Okay, so you're going after the belt. Um, Dana has been very vocal about wanting you to be the next uh, up for the belt against Stipe. So how much of a reality is this? Do you think this is going to happen? Uh, yeah. I mean, for sure. Why he, he couldn't, it couldn't happen. I'm the number one contender. And, uh, my last four fights uh, has been all uh, won in the first round. Mm. And then, uh, I think it's time. It's just time to to go there. Yeah. You know, I I I, I prove it. I prove that I uh, I deserve it. One hundred percent. I mean, you you have a record of eighteen three. Um, I've seen you fight. You are a very scary. Fifteen, 15 three. Oh, 18, I'm sorry. Five. You have a record of eighteen fights, fifteen three. That's right. Yeah. Um, you are a scary fighter. You, I mean, when you swing, it's like deadly. So I think that you are definitely um, the man for the job. I know Stipe put it out there that he wanted to fight someone new. But um, I mean, how does it work? Is it just kind of like if Dana pushes for it and you're up for it, do you think he would be down? Or is there someone else in the lineup? 
Well, I think uh, according to the ranking, uh, the champion has to fight the contenders, and there is not a contenders uh, right now who deserve a, a championship uh, than me. Mm -hmm. So at some point, it's sort of uh, an obligation. It's not like uh, a peak, like up to him. You know, uh, being as a contender, you can allow yourself to choose a fight. But as a champion, you just you just have to defend against the contender and the contenders who deserve it. That's a good way of explaining it. Okay. I mean, and you are definitely worthy. You've had five UFC performance of the night awards and so many more awards altogether um, than anyone I've interviewed on the show so far. So that's pretty impressive. I mean, you are a beast and I'm looking, I'm reflecting on your life your story at how determined you are. Like jail couldn't stop you, being homeless couldn't stop you. You made it all the way to number one. I mean, you've only had three losses. You And yeah, so actually in looking at your record, 11 of your wins were by knockout. I mean, that's insane. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think this says about you as a yeah, fighter? I think that's a good that's a good record, but um, now I don't focus most much about my record. Uh, you know uh, what I do is like just trying to do whatever is best uh, and to give it all out there. You know, and the outcome you can't control it. You know, and because sometimes if you're looking about your record, you can just be. In, uh, get um i mean chase the wrong target the wrong yeah. serve the wrong purpose you know yeah you can get um you can get a bad record and still be a good fighter you can have a good record and still uh haven't give a good version of yourself mm -hmm. and that's what i'm focused on is to give the uh, better version of myself than uh looking at my record okay but you have never been knocked out or submitted and that's pretty crazy given that you've made your way up to the number one spot i'm, knock, I'm knocking the wood knocking wood i'm knocking glass i'm knocking everything mm -hmm. for you that's pretty damn cool so uh, what do you think this says about you as a fighter that's very unique uh, no i don't think so i think uh, I'm just a fighter as everyone, you know, and I still have a long career. Uh, so I will not step ahead now and say things, you know, let's see how my careers go and how I discover myself, how I uh, find uh, another version of myself. Okay, you're very mm -hmm. humble. I love that. What happens when you get the title? Mm, life continue. Life continues. You just keep <laughs> fighting and then you, yes. and then you defend sunrise, it. Sunrise and sunset <laughs> as every day, you know, yeah. you just move on, on, on a, that, of, uh, that thing, another dream, uh, or make it bigger because, uh, having a title is not something new. People has been having it a long time before you. Uh, what you can do is to chase something uh, great, the greatness, and make it uh, something unique. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not. It's definitely, definitely not winning the title. Mm. What do you want your legacy to be? You know, you've already made it to a very advanced level in the UFC, but. If uh, if there had to be one statement made about you that the world is going to remember you by, what would it be? Mm, I haven't think about that yet. I still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I I have a I, I see myself having a long life and um, mm -hmm. accomplish a, a lot of things, a lot of things that I'm not even aware of right now. Yeah, that I, mean, I can't even think about it right now. You're only 34. I agree with you. I think you have so much time and, and the determination to, to complete yeah. a lot. 
there are underrated fighters in every weight class. You know, there are some that get a lot more media attention and just overall like are more popular, but then there are some fighters like, um, Jack Hermanson mentioned Arnold Allen as being like one of the best fighters in his eyes, but super underrated. So who would you say that you can think of as one of the most underrated fighters? In my weight class? Yeah. In, my, in, in the heavyweight division, I would say probably Curtis Blade. Mm. He was yeah. your second fight in the UFC, right? Yeah. And he gave me a hard time. Like, uh, <laughs> he was a wrestler that, but since uh, our first fight, I found out that this guy understand, um, he understands uh, striking. And then, yes, I think he's underrated. Okay, fair enough. All right, so Francis. What would you say is your favorite mm -hmm. fight, the fight that you're most proud of so far? My favorite fight? Mm -hmm. The fight that I'm so proud of? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly about that. I know my first fight in the UFC, I was very happy about that. Um, then uh, my second fight against Curtis Blade, I was also very happy about that because I came from two losses. So he was very uh, good to come back with the W, you yeah. know, to the W column. Yes, I was very happy <laughs> for that one, especially that one. So there is a two fight, my yeah. first UFC fight and uh, my second fight against Curtis Blade. How did you get your UFC contract? What promotions did you fight before? And then how did the UFC discover you? I fight for different um, promotions out, out there in France. Uh, one in uh, Sweden and one in Bahrain. And uh, yeah. Then after that, um, my coach was in a contact with some uh, manager and uh, that's how they work on that process to get me um, to get the UFC eyes on me. Wow. It, it looks like you started training in 2013 and then you started fighting in the UFC in December 2015. So you really didn't have to put in much time. I mean, that's a pretty quick timeline. Yes, it was two years. I started training exactly at the uh, in August 2013 in France. Mm. And for me, uh, he was just like um, having fun because I love fighting, but uh, I wanted to do like, I wanted to do boxing. Um, so MMA for me was just fun, you know? Yes, I love fighting, I love action, but uh, there's not a um, classic boxing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. But then your coach convinced you to get into MMA. I wasn't convinced until I think what really get me convinced was the UFC contract. Because even then, after two years, I was just doing it, you know. Mm. Yeah. Then uh, I get the UFC contract. Uh, and then I started like, okay, this might be the opportunity that I've been looking for. I mean... When I talk to guys on the show and I'm like, all right, how did you feel when you got your UFC contract? Some of them were like, oh man, I cried. I jumped up and down. My mom cried. <laughs> how did you feel? Honestly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't expect that. And I wasn't, for me, the UFC uh, dream uh, has, ever, has ever been something that I really want. People were telling me how, uh, I can do good in the UFC, but I was just like, whatever, you know, like keep doing. And then when they tell me, when they tell me that I have my, my UFC contract, um, I think uh, what get me more excited is about it. First of all, I have a fight because it wasn't easy to have a fight uh, in France, uh, in Europe, 
basically in France for me. Um, so uh, what crossed my mind at first was, okay, I have a fight. And then secondly, I'm going to get paid because yeah. yes, uh, I needed it. Uh, I was there for two years. I didn't still uh, haven't have my own house trying to um, be a, uh, being a roommate some, somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I kept doing MMA by the time uh, just because I was getting uh, a few bucks uh, from fighting and also I like fighting, yeah, but my mind wasn't set about the U UFC until I get the UFC contract and then I'm like, okay, I think I should get into this thing for real. That's so crazy, man. If you talk to anybody who's been on my show, they're like, oh, I got the contract. If it wasn't like the contract alone, it was, you know, the contender series. And so they kind of like, they were working towards that. Every, everybody was like, the UFC was my goal. And you're over here like, well, all right, I guess I'll do it. I mean, <laughs> leave it to the number one heavyweight yes. of the world. Yeah. That, um, that exactly how I, I, I react, like, okay, that's cool. Well, and people was like, are you even realize what's going on? I'm <laughs> like, what? They say, okay, you are UFC fighter. I'm like, cool. Then, then what? <laughs> <laughs> so that was exactly me by the time. <laughs> that's so me. funny. Have you ever gotten into a street fight? Like, okay, I, I should say this. Since you have entered the UFC since 2015, have you ever gotten into a fight with someone like at a bar or in the street? No. Uh, before I have my UFC contract, I was in France and I was a uh, bouncer. Mm -hmm. But even as a bouncer, I never really fight. I fought once as a bouncer, but uh, because uh, this guy was smoking in the in the the club and then uh, I have to take him out of the club I took him out of the club and then he went out and uh, he was like uh, upset about it he, he he waited me at the end of the club he went somewhere at the street with his friend and they were with they waited me there uh, that's where I, I fought so it was two against one it was more than two it was a lot of them <laughs> who won Well, um, one of my colleagues saw that and came and he almost beat someone to death. I was like, I'm, I was like holding him like, don't kill somebody, man. Yeah. Like, you know, but um, uh, we, we beat them up and the, the, colleague, the police just uh, came and uh, arrest them because uh, we were working at the club and the police around there, they know the situation. And we explained to them like, okay, we were working there, this happened. Mm. And then um, they take our uh, deposition, everything. So, and then um, they asked us if, if we want a um, suke, uh, how, how do they say that? like press charges to complain yeah yes to press to press charges yeah. about that but uh we didn't i mean we just press i think no we press charges just to protect ourselves because the police uh they said yes if you don't press charges and the press charges you might be in the bad position because the press charges first so we just press that and stop it there Wow, put it that's there and let it, let it go. Okay, so that was the only first time. The only time, interesting. Um, all right, I ask every fighter yeah. this question, and what's interesting for me, and I'm sure the listeners, is that every fighter answers it differently. So, from your perspective, walk us through the differences between winning a fight versus losing a fight. And I don't just mean like, okay, yeah, winning is great and losing sucks, but there's so much pressure put on you guys and you, it seems to me like you understand psychology very well with everything that you've been through in life, you know, from jail to being homeless and, and your struggle to making it really to the top. 
you have the pressure from the fans and then maybe the fans of your opponent and then your friends and your family and your corner who's been busting their butt for you, you know, throughout your training camp and, and your wife and kids. And, and so, you know, there's just so much. And then you know that every single fight that you fight is going to impact you either in one direction or another. It's, you know, going to affect your career. So, now walk us through the differences pressure wise and thoughts that are going through your mind between winning versus losing uh i think if um if you're thinking about uh that way like winning versus losing is very uh stressful you know um and uh i lost a fight once and it was exactly uh because of those type of type of question uh, after my first fight against Stipe, uh, I lost the fight, and I start I started to think exactly like that, mm-hmm. and um, that's why uh, the fight after that, the fight against uh, Derek Lewis, I didn't fight because I was thinking like that instead of fight. I was overthinking. Uh, then after that, I was, I realized uh, what re- what truly count is. Uh, what, how you give, give yourself up, uh, how you, how, how much you put in the fight, you know, uh, you can give your best and still have the, not have the good, the best out, the, uh, good outcome. But as long as you give your best is the most important because losing the fight without giving, giving it all out there, I think that is the uh, true, the true loss. But if you lose after giving everything you get, it's okay. It's happened. It's a fight game. Everything can happen in the fight game. So uh, I don't think like that anymore. Yeah. Uh, my my only concern is: Did I do, do everything that I sh- I should have done? I should have uh, do. Yes, I have done all that I should. So uh, if my question is yes, I'm in peace with myself, no matter what is the outcome, you know? Wow, that's amazing. So that's how I see it. Yeah, you have a lot of self-control mm-hmm. and you're wise. You know, there's, there's I'm, more and more I'm learning that fighters are talking to kind of like, they call them different things, but sports psychologists to kind of help them, you know, visualize the win and... Um, block out the negativity and the distractions and, you know, really focus. Um, Jack Hermanson is, is Mm. one of those guys who's like a big supporter of sports psychology. I think that that's a really good approach. And several of the fighters who have been on the show said the same thing. They said, you know, look, if, if I gave it my all, the loss hurts less, but if I left something out there, then I have regret and regret is the worst feeling. But a lot of them have talked about losing being a nightmare yep. because it's so much pressure. You know, if you have a family, you go home and you know that your family's disappointed for you and then, and you have to like live with that. And then of course, social media, people are very vocal with their opinions and then that can get to you. And, and if you live in a small town, then you go to the grocery store and everybody's aware and it's, you know, you're very high profile. So I, it's, it's, you can't, you can't hide. <laughs> Yes, but you have to know that, uh, and then I think that uh, that's why some people need uh, uh, we need psychologists. You have to know that is the part of the business. You have to get prepared of that. You have to uh, uh, imagine that before, in p- picturing that yourself there, even if you don't you don't uh, want to be there, but at least be aware that it, it can happen, you know. Um, we have some uh, quote in France, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but he will say something like, uh, always um, expect the best, but uh, without uh, always uh, imagine the worst. Um, hope for the best, but you prepare know? for the worst? No, like, uh, yes, something like that. Like you will always fight for the for for the best for the win, but right. also imagine that you can lose, you know. And it happens because it happens. 
there is not uh, a true true reason for losing. Mm. There's it's no true reason for losing. Business. Part of the business. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to be 100% undefeated forever? I don't think so. Sometimes I, uh, I will pick a fighter who have lose uh, than a fighter which, which is undefeated. Because the fighter that have lose fight, he has a different uh, approach and he understand uh, a little bit better than uh, a fighter who ha uh, haven't lose yet. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. so um, because you can also learn from your lose, and when you when you lose, you learn more from it. But when you win, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm the man, party, <laughs> everything, excitement, celebration. But when you lose, it take you down and make you think about what went wrong. And then from there, you can figure out what. So I think from losing, uh, losing will get you better than winning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's exactly what I've heard. But yes, even though nobody want to win, no, nobody want to lose. Everybody want to win. Yeah. yeah. But somebody at some point has to lose, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it works. Uh, what is the biggest celebration you've done after a win? You go to the bottle, uh, to the clubs, you pop bottles or like, like shopping sprees. What, what does Francis do when he wins? You know, um, and I think this is my, that is my problem. I never really celebrate a win like, uh, like that, like a big thing. I'm very happy about it, but li li life moves on, you know. When, when, when you finish the fight and you win, uh, you was you drop down the pressure drops down then you realize you know it was just another fight and you have to move move on you know uh, so what i can do uh, for myself is to take a time off to let him go because uh, you have to take a fight as a as a job as a part time of your life uh, as a some as something that you're doing for a living instead of some Something that you're living for do to do, you know. So mm. uh, then that helps you to deep, to uh, let the pressure go. I mean, yeah. that's my way, my own way to to do. Yeah, I'll just travel and go back home, take time off, you know, cut off everything about fighting, just relax and get back to my life with my family in my country, with my root, just like simple life you know that's my own way to enjoy and to celebrate i love that back to basics now because there was a period of time really your entire life you didn't make much money and then you've gotten to the point where your career you're doing really well you're making money now is it do you have a hard time making big purchases because you want to save everything just in case you end up, you know, not having money again? Uh, I can make big purpose if it's necessary. I mean, I don't just like, uh, I don't like like unnecessary purpose, you know, because at some point I find my, I found myself just buying stuff. Then I realized I don't need all those things. Yeah. Like, uh, okay, since I have the money in my bank, okay, let's buy this. Oh, this is nice. The, oh, this is great. I love this. Okay, what were you going to do with that? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And then, you know, uh, that's the kind of thing that I, I kind of avoid. But uh, if it's necessary, I will do it. You know, um, I, I spend my money, I use it uh, for my family. When I go back home, I spend a lot of money. But at the meantime, uh, I can buy something, even though he, he will cost $500, uh, $500 because I don't find found that uh, necessary. But when something is necessary, you put the price. Mm -hmm. So what's your favorite junk food, Francis? I think everybody like a, uh, a bad food because bad food is unfortunately what is good. Yeah. Like um, what people get excited about it. 
Like you people will say, oh, I love cookies. Oh, I love chocolate. Oh, yeah. I would love to eat, uh, you know, some steak and this today, uh, some hamburger. But you never see somebody like, oh, I'm excited. I'm going to eat some salad this weekend <laughs> or I'm going to eat some broccoli. You know, you never yeah. see people say that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I never see somebody like, oh, I'm so excited. I, ha I have my salad that I'm going to eat. You know, uh, <laughs> wow. I can't wait until I get back home. No, you never hear stuff like that. So you were a Mike Tyson fan when you were younger. Are you still a fan of his? Of course. If I to you ask, are you still a fan of him? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are definitely Mike Tyson fans over here. Got it. So what do you think about him fighting at age 54? Well, you know, um, I don't know much about that, but uh, when I see his training, he looks pretty good. Do you have any words of wisdom that you can share with the listeners? And it doesn't have to be fight related, but you seem like a very wise man who's been through a lot in life. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for people who are trying to follow their dreams? Oh, kick the negativity out. Don't listen to people uh, who are negative because uh, they, you will find a lot of people out there uh, <clears throat> who tell you what will work and what will not work for you. What is this? As they know everything, they don't know shit. Mm. Only God no, you know. And then uh, because sometimes their life, their proper life, is not a set as an as an example. So why do somebody will tell you that you cannot do it Why his, when his own life is not a proof of success or of uh, wisdom, you know? And then, uh, yeah, just chase your dream. Uh, everybody is allowed to, to, uh, 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 to fail, you know, as long as you keep trying, giving it all, uh, that's what matter, you know. Uh, for me, succeed is not like uh, get what you want, but to give, to give, do your best to get what you wanted, even though you don't have it. But as long as you give it all, I will still consider that as a succeed, as a success, because you can be in peace with yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. You just have to get up and keep going and um, your story. Keep going no matter what. Keep going no matter what. I love it. That's great advice for me. Very inspirational. Thank you, Francis, for coming on the Jenna Ben Show. Give us your Instagram handle so people know how to find you. Oh, my Instagram is Francis Ngano. Okay. Just, Perfect. Yeah. Just your name. Okay. And yeah. um, yes. Um, I want to give a shout out to to my coaches too, uh, Eric okay. Nisik, um, um, the black uh, the black cobra, <coughs> Dewey, and um, my teammate and everyone out there, my fans. I'll give a big shout out mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for all the support. Oh, you are such a sweetheart. Okay, um, when I come to Vegas, I'm gonna come by Extreme or something. Hopefully Uriah will be in town too and then we can all catch up. Or Eric, I owe Eric a lunch too. So um, it'll be great to meet in person. And if you have anything that you wanna contribute to the studio and sign for me, I would love it. No pressure. Um, Thank you very much, Francis. I'm gonna shoot you a follow on Instagram right now. And guys, you can find me on Instagram at The Jenna Ben Show. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for tuning in week after week. Y'all keep me going in this crazy grind. I love you guys and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.